Welcome to another midweek lesson from Grace Christian Assembly. Open your Bible and join us as we dig into the Word. Now, here's our teacher, Jim McClarty. We're in Exodus 3 tonight. We're going to continue talking about this absolutely amazing conversation that is going on between Moses and God at the burning bush. And of course, there are a great many theological implications to be had from all of this information. And I want to pick up to some degree on where we left off last week. At the end of last week, we had looked at God telling Moses very specifically to go say a particular thing to the Israelites and show them a particular series of signs. And then God said, now when you say these things and show the Israelites, my people, these signs, they will believe them. They will respond. And then he said, then you're going to go say these words to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and you're going to show them these same signs, and they're not going to believe you. And there was this very clear contrast, this differentiation between go show these signs and say these things to my people, and they will believe it. Go show these signs and say these things to the Egyptians, and they won't believe it. Same message, same signs. And so Moses, of course, we're seeing this very consistent personality profile of Moses. And Moses continues to argue and disagree and say, who am I? And you're going to see another one of his excuses this evening. He's going to say, I don't speak well. Who am I to go and do these things? And so God tells him, I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not believe you and he will not let my people go because I'm going to harden his heart. And then he says, and because of how he has kept my son Israel, I am going to kill all his firstborn. And anybody who's watched the Cecil B. DeMille movie knows that on the night of Passover, the death angel came through Egypt and killed all the firstborn. But the impression that the movie gives and the impression that the vast majority of the theology of the world gives in explanation for that event is that they say that that is God reacting to the fact that Pharaoh had multiple opportunities to let the Israelites go. But because Pharaoh just would not do it, finally God had no more choice but to kill all the firstborn. But before the first statement was made to Pharaoh, before Moses ever appeared in Pharaoh's court and said, let my people go, God said, I'm going to harden his heart, and I'm going to kill all his firstborn, before anything happened. So we talked about that last week, and we compared it a little bit to uh, Isaiah 10, which I think last week I called Isaiah 20. Isaiah 10, where God worked that way with the Assyrians and brought the Assyrians down on the Israelites, specifically to punish the Israelites. And then God turned around and punished the Assyrians for attacking the Israelites and said they did it with this haughtiness where they thought it was them doing it. But since this is all about me, even though I use them to punish my people, the fact that they punished my people, I'll now punish them. And that led us to Romans 9 last week. Paul's exposition of the entire Pharaoh thing where Paul says, God said, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. And I told you that in the Greek, what it really says is the tenses, the verb tenses are, I will mercy whom I will mercy, and I will compassion whom I will compassion. So Paul draws from that and says, therefore, it's not of him that wills, and it's not of him that runs, but it's of God that shows mercy. You couldn't find a more clear, didactic, theological, doctrinal statement than that. God has said, I'll mercy who I'll mercy, I'll compassion who I'll compassion. Therefore, it's not of him that wills, and it's not of him that runs or does works. It's of God that shows mercy. And in that context, he brings up Pharaoh and says, God said to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that my name would be glorified in all the earth. 
And so we talked last week about, well, then God raised up Pharaoh for the very purpose of glorifying himself. And the way he glorified himself was in the destruction of Pharaoh, which he told Moses before he ever sent Moses into Egypt. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to harden his heart, and I'm going to kill his firstborn. That's what I'm going to do. And so from that, Paul draws the conclusion, so then God will have mercy on whom he'll have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. And that's really hard for us to get a hold of. So we touched last week on some of the theology that people construct to try to get around that idea because that so rubs up against our flesh. The statements are clear. The statements are precise. The statements are strictly Pauline and in the largest context, biblical because Paul is getting all of this from this same section of Exodus we're now reading. And that's the theology that Paul draws from it. Well, Paul's conclusion then is, you will say to me, why does he then yet find fault, seeing that no one has resisted his will? How can God judge people and find fault with them if everybody only did what God willed they would do? And as Larry pointed out, the essential question behind that is, how is that fair? And so people put a whole lot of work into trying to make it more fair. And of course, the more fair you make it, the more you undermine Paul's argument. Paul's statements and theology are designed to drive you to that question, how is that fair? If you make it fair, you completely destroy Paul's question, which means you're now directly opposite Paul's theology. Only if you arrive at the question of fairness are you thinking Pauline. Well, so yet again this week, this subject was brought up by one of the TV preachers that I love to frequent. And he was talking about Romans 9. And he was talking about Pharaoh. And he took the same line that everybody takes who refuses the biblical paradigm. What he said was, and you're all going to nod in agreement because you've heard it your whole life. What he said was, God knew that Pharaoh was going to harden his own heart. And because Pharaoh hardened his own heart, God then, because of Pharaoh's refusal to believe and let the people go, for that reason, God then hardened Pharaoh's heart. God reacted to Pharaoh. God was not the first cause of Pharaoh's hardness. Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then God reacted by hardening it permanently because he refused to accept God's word. How many times have we heard that explanation? Too many. Too many. <laughs> well, as I was listening to him say that, and I've heard it my whole life, suddenly right in the midst of it, I had an apostrophe. <laughs> and <laughs> for those of you who have never watched the movie Hook, I had an epiphany. And I, I started thinking about it. Okay, then let's, let's consider that paradigm for a moment. Let's consider the notion, the idea that really what took place was Pharaoh had an opportunity and he hardened his heart against the opportunity. And therefore, God's reaction that culminated in killing all the firstborn of Egypt was in fact a reaction to Pharaoh's own lack of acceptance or belief. Let's assume for a moment that's true. Okay. Here's the great problem with it. Here's the one question I don't think any of those preachers could solve or answer. If it's true that Pharaoh hardened his heart against God, and therefore when God was talking to Moses at the burning bush, God said, I'll harden his heart and kill his firstborn. God was doing that in reaction to the fact that Pharaoh had hardened his own heart. When did Pharaoh harden his own heart against God? Considering the fact that when God said this at the burning bush, there'd been no message from Yahweh to Egypt yet for Pharaoh to reject. Right? In fact, the Pharaoh he's going to go speak to 
is the Pharaoh that rose up during the 40 years that Moses is in the wilderness. The ones who wanted to kill Moses have all died, which means the Pharaoh now sitting on the throne doesn't know Moses and hasn't heard from Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There has been no message yet by any prophet of Yahweh to Pharaoh for Pharaoh to reject. Right? right? What did Pharaoh reject at this moment that would cause God at the burning bush to declare, I am going to harden his heart? In reaction to what? What did he do? What did he already reject? There's been nothing yet. God hasn't sent a message to the man yet. God hasn't sent a prophet to the man yet. God hasn't revealed yet, let my people go. None of that has happened yet. And God has already declared, I'm going to harden his heart. So if Pharaoh is the first cause of everything that happens, if it is Pharaoh's own heart hardening that is the cause, you have to answer the question, he hardened his heart against what? Because there's no what for him to harden against. And if there is no what to harden his heart against, then God's declaration, I will harden his heart, means that God is the first cause of the heart hardening. God is the one who did it as Paul draws from it in Romans 9 and says, so then he'll have mercy on whom he'll have mercy and who he will, he hardens. That's the conclusion Paul comes to. So if you act like the preacher that I saw Monday who said, well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart first, we would all say, well, that's very fair then. He got a fair shot. He got a fair chance. He had an opportunity. He could have been saved, whatever saved means at this juncture in history. But he could have been God-fearing. He could have done it God's way, and he could have avoided the plagues, and he could have avoided having all the firstborn killed. If he had just responded to the message, he could have done that. Well, that's very, very fair. The problem is the Bible never says that a message came to Pharaoh that he rejected which caused God to reject him. That doesn't exist anywhere. Secondly, from a logical and time standpoint, the very fact that God is talking to Moses at the burning bush before Moses ever takes any message to Egypt and God already says, I'm going to harden his heart and kill his children. You have to be able to answer the question, what did he reject? And third, the theology that Paul draws from it is based on that is intrinsically unfair. And so if you work hard to make it fair, you are completely upended Pauline theology. So if you're going to be biblically consistent and historically consistent, then you have to admit that God said to Moses, you're going to go tell my people and you're going to show them these signs and they're going to believe because God intended that they were going to believe. Why were they going to believe? Because God was keeping a promise he made to Abraham that after 400 years he was going to bring these people, a million or more people, going to bring them back to the promised land. So they had to believe the message because they had to come back. So they were overwhelmed by the sovereignty of God who made sure that all his people did believe, did respond, did react, and did leave Egypt. And the same God said, I'm now going to punish the people who kept them in bondage for 400 years because they kept my son in bondage. Now I'm going to kill their firstborn son because in God's great cosmic sense of right, wrong, and justice, he can bring Assyria down on Israel and then punish Assyria. And he can bring the Israelites into Egypt because he said he would, leave them there for 400 years, bring them out, and punish Egypt. And what is the difference between those who hear it and those who don't, those that are redeemed and those that are punished? What is the difference between those that God declares, they'll hear me, and the ones that God says, I will harden them? What is the difference between those that God shows mercy and those that God hardens? What's the difference? The difference is the same all the way through the Bible. The difference is my people or not my people. Election. Election. All the way through the Bible. How did Israel become my people? God chose them. God chose them. It's not because they were good. It's not because they were right. At this point, for 400 years, they've completely neglected the God of Abraham, Isaac. and In fact, 
when they go out into the wilderness, they're going to continue worshiping their foreign gods. What do they do as Moses is up getting the law on Mount Sinai? They're at the bottom of the hill making a golden calf. These are not God-fearers. These are not those that are following Yahweh, and they're certainly not seeker-sensitive. But they're being drawn to God by God for God's purpose because God is being faithful to a promise he made, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So they, who were chosen to be God's people, are nevertheless, though they don't deserve it, falling under his hand of grace at the very same time that the people that God did not select are falling under the hand of his punishment. And there's no other way to read it. There's no way to be biblically consistent and make that also fair. And Paul knows it, which is why Paul says, you will argue with me and you will say, why does he yet find fault if no one resists his will? And Paul's answer is sovereignty. His answer is, who are you to reply against God? In other words, God's going to do what God's going to do. You'd be much better off to get in line with that than to stand up there on your hind legs arguing with him. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that Pharaoh hardened his heart and God hardened his heart? I mean, both things are true, right? They're both true to the degree that we can say God gives us faith and we believe. Right. The question Christ. becomes first cause. What is the first cause in these things? The first cause of our faith is God's election from before the foundation of the world. The first cause of Pharaoh's <laughs> refusal to let Israel go is that God determined to harden his heart. So it still comes down to absolute sovereignty, right? So Absolutely. even though you can see the reaction of such things, the question is, did God react to Pharaoh? Did he react to you? Or did he act and then we reacted? The biblical paradigm, I'll use that word for the third time tonight. The biblical paradigm <laughs> is that God is the first cause in all things. He mercies who he will and he hardens who he will. And yes, we very genuinely react as a result of what God does, but we're never the first cause. Right? And so for all the folks out there, all our Arminian listeners out there, and I know you're out there because every once in a while you type to me, please explain to me, if you don't like everything I just said, please explain to me what exactly it was that Pharaoh heard from Yahweh that he rejected that caused God to then harden his heart. That's the piece of evidence you don't have, and it's the piece of evidence that you most vitally need in order to make your version of the Bible work. The reason your version of the Bible doesn't work is you got no evidence, and we've got it all. So we win. <laughs> and, and in response, we get a woo-woo. Not an amen, not a hallelujah. We got a woo-woo. Yes, ma'am. He is the first cause of everything, which is exactly why the Bible starts with, you know, God. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, the first four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. God. There's no one there to check with. There's no one there to run anything by. There's no one there to approve whatever he does next. And so in the beginning, God, yeah. So that means he is, in fact, the first cause of absolutely everything. Everything else that happened happened as a result of the fact that first, in the beginning, God. Right? Yeah. yeah. You are very biblical in your thinking there. Very good. All right, let's start at chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10, Therefore come now, God speaking to Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? Starting this conversation of I can't, not me, get somebody else, you got the wrong guy. Every excuse he can come up with. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you 
that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this mountain. We talked about that two weeks ago and again last week. Moses says, how can I do this? And he says, I'm going to be with you. That's how you're going to do it. Yes, you have no capability. That's the point. But I'm God. I'll be with you. And then he says, the evidence that I'm with you is that when you bring the children of Israel out, I'll bring you back to this very mountain. So when you get back to this mountain, you'll know that it was me that did all that. As if the ten plagues weren't sufficient proof, as if the frogs, the lice, I would think burning hail would be a pretty good indication God's on your side. And by the time the Red Sea opens, you've got a pretty good sense that God is on your side. God doesn't include any of that and instead says, when I bring you back to this very mountain, that's how you'll know I was with you. These great big answers that God responds with. So verse 13, then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus you will say to the sons of Israel, I am sent me to you. We looked at that at length in the last couple of weeks, so we'll keep going here. Verse 15, And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, here's the message. Go to the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to the land flowing with milk and honey. And look at verse 18. And they will... Pay heed to what you say. How does God know that? He got lucky. Yeah. Because he decreed it. Because in the beginning, God. Absolutely. Because God knew that he was going to give them the faith and the ability to believe the message. 400 years, they've lost all sense of who that God is. Who is this Yahweh God? We've been in bondage for 400 years. And now you want us to believe that God cares about our affliction? So God says, despite the condition they're in, they will pay heed to you and they will listen. They will hear you. Which, by the way, if we were to define free will the way that the Arminians define free will as being the ability at any moment in time to choose to do or not to do freely without any interruption or influence from any outside source or influence that you have the right at every moment, the right of choice to choose to or not to, then God cannot possibly say with any confidence at all that they would hear him because they have the option not to. They have the absolute unencumbered freedom to listen to them and make up their own mind. And yet here God has said, they're going to hear you. They're going to listen to you. It's very much like Jesus walking around saying things like, my sheep hear my voice. That's a didactic statement. My sheep hear my voice. And he says, a stranger's voice, they'll not follow. But they will hear my voice and they will follow me. And I call my own sheep out by name. So why do they hear? Because they're his sheep. They already belong to him. Because they're his, they hear him. They don't become his by hearing him. They hear him because they're his. And he calls them out by name. And therefore, they hear. Well, that's perfectly in keeping with the God of the book of Exodus, who says, go and tell them this, and they will Pay heed to what you say. And you, with the elders of Israel, will come to the king of Egypt. And you will say to him, 
the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now compare verse 18 to verse 19. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go. Well, wait a minute. What about his free will? So certain people, God's going to speak to through his prophet. They will pay heed. They are going to pay attention. Then you go with the elders and you go tell Pharaoh that I said that my people need to come out and worship me. He's not going to listen to you. How does God know this? How does God know this if genuine free will exists? He couldn't, he couldn't know it. There's no possible way for him to know it. Instead, God is decreeing what will happen because he's God in everything that you could conceive God being. Listen, here's what we know for sure. Among human beings, to whatever degree we have any control over anything, we exert that control. It's why men like a remote control. All the men in the room just agreed. <laughs> men don't care what's on TV. We only care what else is on TV. So we want the remote control. And we'll flip and we'll flip and we'll flip because it even has the word control in it. And we're in control of it. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> to whatever degree we can exert control, we do. And then, let's see, you're talking about God who made everything, who controls everything, who describes himself as being the almighty, the omnipotent, the one with all the power, which means he's in charge of absolutely everything. Well, then he's going to exert his control over absolutely everything because that is the domain and breadth and scope of the control he has. If there is anything in God's universe that has the capacity and ability to control and empower itself, then God is not all-powerful. God describes himself as proper name, God Almighty, the one with all the might, the one with all the power, which is why we use the big theological term omnipotent, omnipotent. He's the one with all the power. And then the very same folk who will say, well, God, sovereign, all-powerful, except over me, because I have the right to pick and choose and do whatever I want, and I'm not going to have that God ruling over me. If you have the power to throw that God off, he's not all powerful. You're also powerful. You are self-motivating. You are under your own control. And he's only semi-powerful. Which means he lied when he gave himself the proper name of God Almighty. Or when Nebuchadnezzar awoke from his madness and came to the conclusion that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as, remember the next word? Nothing. nothing. They're reputed in God's eyes as nothing, and God does all his good pleasure, whatever he wants, among the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can stop his hand, and no one can ask him, what are you doing? And yet, human beings wander around thinking that they can stop God's hand and question him about what he's doing. Well, that would make him only partially powerful to whatever degree will allow him to be powerful. But the actual God of the Bible is the one who describes himself as being able to say, my people will hear your message. And those that are my enemies that I'm going to punish, they're not going to hear you. But go tell them anyway. I've said this before, but here's yet another example of it. Here a good Old Testament example of it. One of the great advantages to Reformed theology, one of the great advantages to understand God's electing grace is that as a preacher, as an expositor and advocate of the Bible, we actually know that there are people who exist who will hear it. It's a really sad, frustrating, difficult thing to go out and try to preach to people when you believe it's up to them to believe it or not believe it especially if you're convinced that heaven and hell lays in the balance here. You know, Sam, you, you're going to go to hell if you don't pay attention to me. Sam, you're going you're to go to hell if you don't listen. Sam, you don't. And so I'm constantly trying to appeal to your 
sense of, of fairness or logic or anything I, just to get you to say this in his prayer and just please accept Jesus because if you don't, then, then he'll have no choice but put you in hell forever. Oh, please, Sam, believe. And you just say, well, that guy's a nut and I'm not going to do what he says. And I go around the rest of my life believing that the blood of Samuel is on my hands because I didn't manage to say whatever words were necessary to convert Sam and he's going to go to hell because I just couldn't do it. How am I going to sleep ever again? I'd be far better off never talking to Sam because then there's no chance that I might fail Sam. I'm just going to leave him to somebody else. Let Sam's blood be on somebody else's hands. I don't want the responsibility of telling Sam anything about God. But if it's this God I'm talking about, if it's the God of the Bible I'm talking about, I have no fear whatsoever saying, Sam, let me tell you about the God of the Bible. Because if you can hear it, I can't get you away from him. If you can hear it, if you know the God of the Bible, if he's drawing you, you can't avoid him. He's going to grab you, shake you, change your life, draw you to himself, and you can't run away from him. You can't hide. Whatever you do, that God's going to get you. And if you're not his, no amount of talking I do and no amount of convincing I do and no matter how much Bible I put in front of you, you're not going to hear it. You're going to run away because you can't hear it because you're not sheep. And I'm going to sleep fine tonight because I realize it wasn't me that lost you. It was God that didn't save you. And I can live with that. Just teach the Bible, preach the gospel, leave the saving up to the Holy Spirit. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't do what the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit can convict you, draw you, change you from within, and convict you in such a way that nobody can ever shake you from that faith. I can't do that. If I could talk you into it, somebody else can talk you out of it. Big deal. But if the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of you, you will hear it. Therefore, God can say, when you preach this to them, Moses, they will listen to you. And, oh yeah, Pharaoh, not going to listen. He's not my people. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I will do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. So was it any surprise to God when he did like, let's say, the lice thing? The lice thing. <laughs> he brings on hordes of lice so the lice are in their food and in their clothes and in their hair and you can't escape them and you get lice everywhere. What an uncomfortable way to live. I wonder if he checked with the lice to see if they willed to go. And so, so yeah, so the horrible lice thing and then Pharaoh says, okay, call off the lice and I'll let you go. And so Moses calls off the lice and then Pharaoh says, eh, never mind, not going to let you go. Was that a surprise to God? No, nope. or to Moses. Or to Moses. Yeah. You don't hear Moses saying, Oh, <laughs> I don't know how many more of these I got in me. Come on. Okay, let's try frogs. No, God says, that's all going to happen that way because I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt. Now, Moses has yet to go and tell Pharaoh anything yet. And yet God has already said, I'm going to strike Egypt. And I'm going to do a bunch of wonders and miracles. And then, under the compulsion of me killing all the firstborn, then he's going to let you go. There's been no message to Egypt yet. There's been no preachment to Egypt yet. There's been no opportunity to accept or believe. There's been no opportunity to exercise any kind of free will. There are only the declarations from God. He won't believe you, and I'm going to punish him. That's the only God you find in the Bible. And by the way, if that's the way Cecil B. DeMille had depicted the film... The box office would have been really low. I would still watch it. You would? You'd be the one who'd line up and buy a ticket for a movie that came out in the 1950s. Yeah. So. <laughs> I will grant the Israelites, verse 21, 
I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go out, you won't go empty-handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman that lives in her house. They'll ask for articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you'll put them on your sons and your daughters, and thus will you plunder the Egyptians. So first, borrow everything you can from your neighbors. Get all the silver and gold and clothes and everything you can get from them. They'll give them to you because they'll have just endured 10 unbelievable plagues that culminated with the death of all the firstborn. They're going to want you gone so badly that they'll give you whatever it takes to get you to leave. So you take all the clothes and all the gold and all the silver from your neighbors, and then, bonus, I drown your debtors. What a good plan! <laughs> Where's that now? <laughs> that takes us to chapter 4. We're finally into new material. And for those of you who were here last week, I put a little addendum onto the why God gave them gold and silver and raiment and clothes and stuff before he took them out in the wilderness. Remember that, what that was? Yeah. Make, furniture. make furniture, make a temple. What's the first thing he's going to do when he comes off the mountain? Take up an offering. Go to these people and give me gold and silver and fine linen and everything so that I can build my tabernacle. Well, you can't ask that of a bunch of impoverished slaves. So while on the surface it looks like, man, God did great by these people and gave them all this gold and silver and wealth and everything, and then God gets them out into the wilderness after the whole Red Sea thing and says, offering time. And it's the only place in the Bible where you'll find that they actually had to stop the offering collection because they reached the point where they said, okay, that's too much. We're going to see that because God provided them with so much that he could take an offering from them that was more than he needed. So there's this whole other divine plan at work underneath the go and plunder your neighbors thing. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, what if they will not believe me? Or listen to what I say, for they might say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Now, God just said, when you say this to them, they will believe you. In response, Moses, who we see very consistently, he's very quick to just put his foot in his mouth and say the wrong thing. So, uh, okay, God, you just said, and I mean, I like the whole burning bush, not consumed or anything, shoes off holy ground, all that stuff. That's all very convincing. But um, I'm worried about me here. I'm worried about my ego, my pride. What if I go and say that to them and they don't believe me? What about that then, God? Huh? And you got to learn to read the white spaces between the black lines to get the huh out of it. And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. He has a walking stick with him. Then God said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and Moses ran away from it, <laughs> which is funny. It's okay to laugh at that. That would be my response. Yeah. I mean, we'll stay in the presence of a burning bush and the voice of God speaking to him, but snake runs away. But the Lord said to Moses, despite his running away, stretch out your hand and take it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand, and he caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. And God said that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And the Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand into your bosom, or inside your coat. So he put his hand into his bosom, inside his robe, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous, white like snow. Then he said, put your hand back in your bosom again. So he put his hand back into his bosom again. And when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And it shall come about that if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, then they may believe the witness of the last sign. But it shall be that if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will be blood on the dry ground. So not only now has God said, speak my words and they'll believe it, but if they want to know that it's the real God that said these things, do the snake thing, put your hand in and bring it out leprous, and then take water from the Nile, pour it out, and it'll be blood. 
And by then they will say, well, clearly you've spoken to somebody who is pretty big because how can you do these things? Verse 10, Moses now says to the Lord, please, Lord. Now, God has answered every question. Who am I? Don't worry, I'll be with you. What if they don't believe me? They will. Okay, what if they still won't believe me? Okay, I'll give you some signs. But Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past, nor since you've spoken to me. So he's saying, I've never been able to speak well. And then he says, come to think of it, I've never spoken well in the past. And come to think of it, standing here now talking to you, I still don't have any eloquence. What about that? He says, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, which is very interesting language, which has caused different commentators through the years to discuss and argue about what sort of speech impediment did Moses have. It was either a stammer or a stutter or a, some kind of cleft lip or some kind of <laughs> problem when he spoke. <laughs> but we're so used to watching Cecil B. DeMille we're so used to seeing NRA guy, what, who, what's his name? Charlton. Charlton Heston. We're so used to seeing Charlton Heston up there saying, let my people go, <laughs> that we think Moses was this great orator because he makes these great speeches. He stands up in front of all the children of Israel. Stand now, behold the deliverance of your God. Bang, 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 bang. It's not the way he spoke. But if... They had had an actor playing Moses who talks like that. <laughs> the whole movie would have been far less compelling. It would be more interesting. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. Come back, come back, come back. Come back. I didn't mean to lose you. All I was trying to do was demonstrate that we have idealized and Hollywoodized the idea of Moses. Moses, all the way through this entire conversation, has argued for his inadequacy. He said, I can't do it. Who am I? They won't believe me. How am I going to do this? God answers him every time, every time with a good answer. And finally he goes, look, I don't speak well. I'm not eloquent. Never have been. Still not to this moment. I'm slow of tongue. I'm slow of speech. And look at God's answer. And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes man dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Oh, wait a minute. Because these guys on TV keep running around trying to drive out the demon of deafness out of these children. <laughs> the devil of blindness has to come out of you. If you're healthy and doing well, it's God, God, God's doing all that. But if you have any kind of sickness, blindness, deafness, can't speak, dumb, that's the devil. It's the devil that did that. Drive that devil out of you. Did God say or did he not? Moses, I know you talk like that. I made you like that. Who makes man's tongue? And who makes the deaf and the dumb and the blind? And the seeing, do not I, God, do all these things? That's extreme sovereignty. That's a God who makes people deaf, dumb, or blind, or halt, or lame, or sick. Does that bother you? Does it upset you to think of a God that's willing to do that? No. Because it's exactly the way... Jesus talked about God. Flip over for a moment to John, John 9 in the New Testament. Gospel of John, chapter 9. A remarkable story of God healing a man born blind. But right in the middle of the encounter with this man who's been blind from birth, his disciples are going to get into a discussion, going to get into an argument as to why this man was born blind. 30 years this man's been wandering around blind. And they're going to discuss 
Why was he born blind? They want Jesus to provide a reason. They want a rationale. This is a bad thing that happened. This man's been blind for 30 years. That's some kind of an affliction. That can't be from God. We want to know why it happened. And they suppose that it must be God reacting to sin. Because they're saying a bad thing happened here. And if God is the cause of the bad thing, God must be reacting. God would never just make somebody blind. Chapter 9 starts. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned that this man should be born blind? Was it the man or was it his parents? They want a reason. Okay, this man was born blind. He's been blind for 30 years. We want to know why. We want a reason, Jesus. And the only reason we can think of that would be fair would be if God reacted to sin. Somebody sinned and God had to react and punish this boy by making him blind. That would be fair in our mind. So who sinned? That's a funny question because then they say, was it the man that sinned? He's born blind. What could he have done in the womb that would have been so bad that God said, well, that's it. Now you're blind. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You kicked your mom in the ribs one time too many. What could he have done? Isn't it a funny question? What did this man do to be born blind? So then who, who did it? The man or was it his parents? Maybe his parents did something so bad that God smited the parents by giving them a blind child. Extra trouble for them. He'd have to be provided for his whole life and he'd have to beg and maybe he'd be an embarrassment to them. So we want a reason, Jesus. Tell us why would God do this? And Jesus answers, and says, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. So Jesus takes the sin question right out of it and says, no, this wasn't about sin. No, this is not a reaction. But it was done in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. Wait a minute. Are you telling me, Jesus? that this boy was born blind and has lived for more than 30 years as a blind man just so you'd have somebody to heal when you got here? Jesus says, yeah, that's it. That's the answer. <laughs> I'm going to get glory to myself and I'm going to glorify God and I'm going to display the great works of God and I needed somebody to do that with and for that reason, that man's been blind for 30 years. Is that the way we think of God? It ought to be. Because that's the only God you find in the Bible, the one who said to Moses, I make man's mouth. And who makes a man to be deaf or dumb or blind or seeing? I do these things. Because ultimately, not only is God sovereign, but he does all things to his own glory. And he knows how to get glory for himself out of deafness or blindness or dumbness or miraculous seeing. And if you live your whole life with an affliction, with a sickness, God knows how to get himself glory out of that. And even if it is an affliction that is terrible for you, God is willing to put you through it if it gets him glory. Because it's all about God glorifying himself. And you've got to get on that side of the equation or you'll never have any peace with the God of the Bible. Because you'll constantly be arguing that the God of the Bible can't be like that. But he's exactly like that. And once you get a hold of that, then the afflictions of this life are easier to bear because you know that they have a purpose and that God is glorifying himself in the afflictions he's taking you through. Do you think when this man was healed and then later Jesus walks up and introduces himself to the man in the temple, proving that it was not the man's faith that got him healed. It was Jesus' power and glory that healed the man. Do you think the man spent the rest of his life bemoaning his 30 years of blindness or celebrating the fact he could see? Anybody he talked to, he told the story of how Jesus healed him. You know he told that story over and over again. And that whole 30 years of blindness, yeah, that happened, but let me tell you what else happened. And God got glory from it. Back to Exodus real quick. We'll wrap up here. We have to get our theology in line with Jesus' thinking, which is that God is perfectly willing and capable 
and uh, often does bring about affliction, put it on people, and he does it for his own glory. He's doing to demonstrate who he is. He's God. He does all these things. So the Lord said, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Verse 12. Interestingly, at this moment, God does not say, And now I will heal you, and you will speak like Charlton Heston, and it will be just like the movie. Instead, God says to him, So then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whoever you will. God has just said, It's you. I'm going to send the message by you. I'll tell you what to say. And then he says, Please, Lord, send it by, oh, whoever you want. Not me. Maybe there's somebody out there. Send it by him. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, to which I would like to add, it's about time. <laughs> Isn't it? What a conversation this has been. <laughs> if my kids back talk me twice, the conversation escalates very fast. Right? How many times here has Moses back talked God? <laughs> yeah, at least four. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, the one he picked, the one he chose. And yet God now is getting angry with him. This, by the way, is not the last time God's going to get mad at Moses. This is going to happen repeatedly as God and Moses continue to struggle with each other. And he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? Don't you think God knows that there is? He just named him by name. I know that he speaks fluently. How would God know that? I made him speak fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, we have to assume it's been a number of years since they've seen each other, possibly as many as 40, because we know that Moses' mom is in Egypt. And here's his brother Aaron. In a little while, we're going to see that God is going to tell Aaron to go out and meet his brother Moses. So here he tells Moses, I know that your brother Aaron is coming to see you. How does he know that? Because he's going to go to Aaron and say, go see him. So God, again, is in complete, absolute control of everything that takes place here. So he says, I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he's coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. And you are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Where in the Cecil B. DeMille movie was Aaron? Yeah. Did you ever see Aaron do any speaking for Moses? No, of course not. Yeah. Exactly. And you'll speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. So who spoke to the children of Israel? Aaron. Aaron. And it shall come about that he shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be as a God for him. So God says, I'm going to speak to you. You're going to tell Aaron, and Aaron's going to speak. Why didn't God just heal Moses? He didn't want to. Well, now he's mad at him. And he's mad at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fine, I'll just give you your brother. Fine. And what's going to happen when they get out into the wilderness? And Aaron and Miriam, who are Moses' brother and sister, they start getting all uppity and saying, oh, wait a minute, how come Moses is the important guy? I mean, doesn't God talk to us sometimes, too? Maybe we should make this a three-way deal. Maybe I should be as important as Moses. I mean, this whole family thing is going to be a real thorn in his side. And so, moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and it shall come to pass that he will be as a mouth for you, and you shall be as God to him. And you shall take in your hand this staff, 
with which you shall perform the signs. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. And behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. God said all that before Moses ever went to Egypt and said the first thing to Pharaoh. God already declared he won't hear you. He won't listen. He won't be convinced. And I'm going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. And I'm going to do it because of how he afflicted Israel, my firstborn. And I'm not going to give him a choice. And I'm not going to listen to his will. And I'm not going to give him any. I'm just, I'm going to do this because I'm God. That'll take us to verse 24 where we'll pick up next week in one of the more peculiar cryptic little passages where Moses is going to stop at an inn with his wife and son. And God is going to come there to kill Moses. He's just told Moses, yeah, see, what? His anger's burning against Moses. He tells Moses, go do these things. And then Moses takes off with his son and his wife. Stops in an inn, and God shows up at the inn to kill Moses. So this relationship is not real, you know, lovey-dovey so far. Not exactly a synergistic relationship. So, all right, we'll, we'll pick up there next week. Somebody mark your Bible at verse 24 of chapter 4, right? And we'll go from there next week. Because God is love. That's right. He's coming to kill Moses because God is love. That's right. Isn't that stuff fascinating? I do not know why preachers can't find enough in the Bible to get up and speak from the Bible week to week. I keep flipping channels, waiting for somebody to be talking about the Bible, and they tell, you know, fishing stories and hunting stories, or supermarket, football analogies, Covey stuff, Norman Vincent Peale stuff, all that. And I keep going, where's the Bible in all this? There's so much great, great, great stuff in the Bible. I just talked for an hour and 10 minutes and I feel like I scratched the surface. There's so much to say. There's so much great, great content going on here. And did you notice how easy it was for us to go from the Old Testament to the New to the Old to the New and find the exact same concepts and the same theology and the same structure of the same God? This Bible is an absolutely amazing book and I agree with Tom, when I die, my headstone's going to say this was all introduction because I've just barely touched on how great this text is that we get to work from. and ah, it, it amazes me over and over again. Any questions? Anything? Um, yes? Why would God be mad at Moses if he made him do everything he did? Did you hear Sam's question? No. We did. Why does he yet find fault considering no one has resisted his will. Isn't that what your question was? Potter. No, well, Romans 9. The end of Job. No. The end of Job. Yes. Romans 9, which we talked about last week. This is in the context of God saying, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. Abraham had two descendants. And then he said, Jacob I've loved, Esau have I hated. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. For this very purpose I raised Pharaoh up to demonstrate my power in him, that my name will be proclaimed throughout the whole earth, so that he mercies who he desires and he hardens who he desires. And you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Because who resisted his will? Isn't that the question you just asked? See, here's the point. The proper biblical theology will make you ask that question. And if you don't ever ask that question, you're not thinking biblically. 
Paul knows you're going to ask that question. And he just did. <laughs> but he asked it in the context of Moses and Pharaoh. And he said, well, why would God get mad at Moses if God knew that's what Moses was like? And, and that's what Moses did. How could God be mad at him? Hey, Sam, you're a Romans 9 guy. You're a Romans 9 guy. The answer, Sam, is, is the same answer that Paul gives. You will say to me, why does he still find fault? Who's resisted his will? On the contrary, who are you? O oh, man, who answers back to God? The thing that is molded will not say to the one that molded it, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for common use. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he called, not from the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. The answer to the question, that's not fair, is always... Who are you? That's what God's like, and that's what God does. And you have to align yourself with the fact that that's what God's like, and that's what God does. Now, God never gives up on Moses. Later, he's going to argue to Miriam and Aaron and say, I might speak to you in dreams, but I speak to Moses face to face. Why weren't you afraid to speak against my prophet? And he's going to defend Moses. But first, he has to break Moses of that pride he has. First, Moses has to be broken of that willfulness and that I can't do it and I'm no good and why do you want me and get somebody else until he breaks Moses down to the point where Moses goes, you know what, this is all about God and it's not about me. And, you know, if I die, I die. Let's go talk to Pharaoh. And God, in all fronts, is angry with disfaith. Anything that is not of faith is sin, and God hates sin. And God is angry at Moses for his sinfulness because God is always angry at sin. But shouldn't God at this point have said, well, then skip it, Moses, go to hell? <laughs> right? Just let Aaron do it all. Yeah, I'll just, I got Aaron, he'll do it. I mean, he couldn't be more argumentative. God should have given up on him. But the grace of God is that he never gave up on Moses, even when he was angry at him. But God is always angry at sin. God is always angry at a lack of faith. Does that make sense? Okay. I think it's remarkable, though, that you fell right into the question that Paul knew his theology would drive you to. He set you up. <laughs> the Bible set you up. Thank you for joining us for this week's lesson. If you would like more information about Grace Christian Assembly or the teaching of God's sovereign grace, please visit us on the World Wide Web at salvationbygrace.org.